Some of Hollywood's most magical movie moments are created using optical effects. I mean, it would be like that, right? Elements which could never be shot together are filmed separately and then combined seamlessly into a single image. Now in complete control! Almost every film ever made contains a number of optical effects, and sometimes that number is in the hundreds. Four-time Academy Award winner Ken Ralston is known as a modern-day master of optical illusions. Today, we'll catch up with Ken as he embarks on a new project at his longtime home, George Lucas's Industrial Light and Magic. We'll also find out how optical effects help make King Kong come alive. And we'll meet the legendary Linwood Dunn, whose optical printer changed the way films were made. Coming up we unveil the secrets of Hollywood's optical magicians on Movie Magic. While there are many types of optical effects, one of the most widely used is the composite, which involves blending two or more pieces of film into a single image. This process is not as simple as it sounds. In the early days, composite shots for films like The Great Train Robbery were done right inside the camera. Director Edwin S. Porter shot the moving background first, covering a portion of the lens. He then rewound the film, covered the other portion of the lens, and shot the actors. In the 1930s, filmmakers began to develop the optical printer as a means of combining images. Linwood Dunn, a cameraman at the time, quickly became known as the finest practitioner of optical effects with films such as King Kong. I did the optical printing for the studio, and so when I walked in on the stage one day and saw them trying to put shots together in a more difficult way than they could on an optical printer, and I then said, look, you shoot those things separately, and I'll put them together, and if you want to change the contrast or make it lighter or darker, I just run them through again. Five years later, in 1938, Dunn was presented with an especially difficult optical challenge. He had to combine shots of stars Katherine Hepburn and Cary Grant with a full-grown leopard named Baby. The optical printer was used in bringing up Baby because they found early in the film that the trained leopard was a little too dangerous to have in with the principal actors. The shot, for example, where up in the hallway, Cary Grant walks through, gets in an elevator, the leopard follows him, and then Hepburn follows the leopard, were all shot separately. But we always had to shoot the leopard first because we wanted to see how fast he walked. So, the next one is Grant. The next one is Hepburn. 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 Dunn eventually created complex opticals for nearly a thousand films, including Cimarron, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. On Citizen Kane, when Orson Welles came to the studio, of course he never heard of an optical printer, and Finally, one day we introduced him to it and let him know that it was a magic machine and there many things could be done with it. He would ask for actually ridiculous things that from a practical standpoint, you wouldn't attempt them. And I would say, no, you can't, uh, it isn't uh, practical to do. And he'd say to me, is it impossible? And I'd say, nothing's impossible, it's just a matter of time and money. 
so I got into a realm in optical printing that I never had before, and in most all cases, it came out successfully. Every independent poll shows that I'll be elected. For this scene, Dunn used his optical printer to combine live-action elements of Wells, the people in the aisles, and actor Ray Collins with matte paintings of the poster of Wells and the seated audience. One of the more interesting shots recreated in post-production was the one where the camera went up the side of the building in the storm, over the roof, and through the skylight down into the nightclub. They were two separate scenes, and when Wells wanted to combine it into a continuous scene, I introduced a synthetic lightning flash on the optical printer, combined it by an autofocus mix with the reverse zoom going down into the nightclub. By the year 1942, dozens of optical printers were in use in Hollywood. Each one of these printers was custom designed. Linwood Dunn was hired to create an optical printer which could be mass-produced by the military. The need for an optical printer in the training films in World War II became very apparent when directors like Frank Capra got into the service in the Signal Corps. And they were commissioned to make certain kind of training films and propaganda films. And so they were used to having the certain sophistication that motion pictures have. They couldn't order them because it was not a shelf item like a camera. So Kodak commissioned me to design printers and see that they were manufactured for the United States government. The Acme Dunn optical printer quickly became the standard and Dunn was honored with an Academy Technical Achievement Award which was upgraded to an Oscar in 1981. I believe I've been very lucky in my career because it covered a good many years from the silent days through sound and into all this new technology. But I think the most rewarding part of it uh, is the number of wonderful people that I've worked with. I loved what I did and I uh, have the benefit of tremendous satisfaction because I can look on the screen today and see things I did. リングドダンは50年間近くもオプティカル効果に携わり数々の名シーンを生み出しました。彼がスクリーンに残したものこそ、まさにムービーマジックと言えるでしょう。ダンの功績を今日に引き継ぐのが、ジョージ・ルーカ
リウンドダンと同じくオプティカルプリンター One of return of the Jedi's effect supervisors was Ken Ralston After winning an Academy Award for Jedi Ken went on to capture three more Oscars for Cocoon Who framed Roger Rabbit and the effects driven comedy Death Becomes Her I have a background that I understand all the different effects that can be done and it's just a matter of knowing what those can accomplish and what best benefits a particular shot. Ken started experimenting with optical effects as a teenager with his no-budget film, The Bounds of Imagination. The Bounds of Imagination was shot when I was 14 years old on weekends and every spare moment we had. It was all 8mm and uh, essentially it started off with a friend, Glenn Anderson and myself, just wanting to do some kind of a project that encompassed a lot of different effects work. But we uh, flipped a coin to see who would be in the show. Unfortunately, I won the toss, so, or lost the toss, so I had to be in it. So we were just going crazy. We had all these split screens in it and double exposures. We had to run off into the closet, back the film up by hand, and start it at the first part of each roll, and then time back to where we thought our split screens would take place. In the early 1970s, just out of high school, Ken worked on television commercials for Cascade Pictures. While helping create these effect scenes, he met an effects artist named Dennis Muren, who soon moved on to work with George Lucas. After a while, Dennis got some script for some obscure film called Star Wars, and they wanted him to work on it. And we were reading the script, and we were just laughing because we would all want to write the same kind of science fiction script, but who would make something so big? Dennis brought me on as a camera assistant. Uh, we had no idea what Star Wars would turn into. Uh, it floored us. It was absolutely the greatest experience. Following the success of Star Wars, Ken worked as an effects cameraman on The Empire Strikes Back. Three years later, he rose to the rank of effects supervisor on The Return of the Jedi. As their reputation grew, Ken Ralston and ILM were called on to create ever more difficult composite shots. In this scene from Back to the Future 2, star Michael J. Fox appears as three different characters. To achieve this effect, Fox would perform as one character, have his makeup changed, and then perform another role on the same set. The three performances were then combined together and printed onto a single piece of film. The pizza shot went on for three days and we had to be on top of every little nuance going on in these shots to make it work. Ken Ralston is an effects artist who specializes in compositing multiple images. His Academy Award winning work in Death Becomes Her utilized his background in optical effects along with cutting edge digital technology. The whole shots in Goldie Hawn, the ones that seem to need the computer graphics the most are the real beauty shots, the close-ups where you really see the texture inside the hole, even though it's a subtle effect. This experience with digital technology is becoming increasingly necessary for effect shots that are ever more complex. It might be nicer to get more happening in here so we could do more, you know, bend his arm a little bit more. So it's not just such a stiff feeling like that. Out of all the puppets we have, this one has the potential to do a little more movement than some of them do. Today, Ken is starting work on a big-budget television commercial about a toy army that attacks a refrigerator filled with Perrier sparkling water. This will require several live-action elements, such as animated dolls, a bicycle, and a toy car. These elements will be integrated with toy soldiers created as computer-generated imagery, or CGI. This will require some elaborate compositing techniques. Ken first meets with producer Clint Goldman and production designer Harley Jessup to plan how the effects will be executed. はじめにプロデューサーと美術監督を交えて使用する特殊効果について話し合います
The okay. bicyclists will be blue screen rod puppets. I was going to say, do you think it would help at all to shoot the bicycle uh, in the in the actual shot instead of shooting it against blue screen? I would love to shoot it in the set, but the uh, the sets uh, will have to make the the bicyclists larger scale than the set just to get the rod puppets to work. So we'll have to shoot them blue screen and mat them in later. It's great so working with Ken. It, one, because it's fun. He, he's really funny. Uh, the other other is that technically he knows what he's doing. Any image is possible to get with him, and it just makes it. For for an art director are really exciting. After looking over the storyboards, Ken works with ILM model makers to produce the collection of toys which will be brought to life. Have him be more active, like he's sitting here and then he runs back here and he sneaks out here and he runs out and he sneaks out here and he's just kind of trying to get a peek through all this stuff. Ken engages model maker Richard Miller to produce another of the show's characters, a mechanical antique doll. The doll's design is based on a series of concept drawings. She's also going to be in the last shot in the commercial, and uh, Richard's sculpting her up, the mechanical puppet to be used, so, out of modeling clay, and then cast it in. Uh, fiberglass shell, so you can put the mechanics in the inside. The eyes will move. This is a radio-controlled uh, eye mechanism for our doll's eye movement. What happens is this this transmitter will send a signal to this little motor and the motor turns the arm which in turn rotates these eyes right and left. So what this means is we don't have to have rods or anything going into the head. We can just, by way of moving these joysticks on the transmitter here, we can have control over that. The doll will ride in a model Citroen, fabricated by veteran ILM model maker Ira Keeler. Like it's, it's a chrome-plated tin on the real on the toy. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's this... fine. It's the more toy-like, the better. We're going to shoot this car blue screen. Camera will be on this side, looking at it. It'll have a nice chassis bounce to it, so it looks like it's having some trouble. This doll will drive the Citroen. His head and arms will move in the shot. His, his arms are uh, flexible, so the wheel actually does the work, so it looks like he's steering. And the head will be rod puppeted to do a little turning. He doesn't do much action. Another important model is a Tour de France bicycle. This doesn't look finished because we're deliberately making it look rough and like a lead, uh, a lead sculpture here. Once complete, the car, bicycle and dolls are filmed in front of a blue screen. The blue screen will later be replaced with the background shot. But for this composite, a computer will be used to combine the elements instead of an optical printer. Uh, any of this is, is fine. He's just kind of looking around. And... With an optical printer, the blue screen is removed photographically. But that requires composited film to be developed before the composite shot can be seen. Digital compositing allows every step of the process to be displayed on screen instantaneously. And optical, if you have an error on your mat, you have to go back and spend an entire day rebuilding all your different elements. In digital, you can see an error and immediately correct it. So the time is reduced tremendously on how long it takes to do a shot. That's perfect. Perfect. Send it, ship it, final. Yow! While most of the elements in this commercial are physical models shot blue screen, Ken has decided that the toy soldier will be created as computer-generated imagery. This allows the animators to make one soldier and then use the computer to replicate it into an entire army. The challenge begins in ILM's model shop, where Richard Miller fabricates a model soldier. These are photographs of a 12-inch maquette which is a sculpture that uh, Richard Miller did and Harley painted up for the basic idea of what the lead soldiers will look like. Even though they'll only be scaled to this, they'll probably be about that high. And this gives computer graphics a starting point as to how the sculpture should look in its design. Next, the model is scanned into a computer to create a three-dimensional image of the soldier. How to work this thing. Computer graphics supervisor Doug Smythe and animator Joe Pasquale Add color, detail, and motion to the figure. There's something strange about our arm action here, even though you've matched yeah, it to what they were doing. It, 
It's a bit extreme in the uh, forward position, I think. It almost looks like they're hyperextending or yeah, popping their elbows. Yeah, this one especially. He's not swinging all the way back. He's just going mm -hmm. like that, like he's got a kink in his arms. With Ken's input, the CGI team completes the animation. Well, that's fantastic. I love what the shadows are doing here. That's really great. Working how the lights, it's just shifting around them like that. The last element needed to complete the commercial is the sparkling water itself. We shoot it locked off slightly wider than what this is, but this is a good starting point to get these uh, measurements down. Once the soldiers attack the refrigerator, the bottles will explode, drenching all the toys with a sparkling shower. Okay, here we go. Ready and action. A pressurized system is used to create this physical effect, which is filmed on a high-speed camera at 120 frames per second. When the film is slowed down to 24 frames per second, the blast of water will appear slow enough for the scene. That wasn't bad. That was real nice. Good. And at 120, we got plenty to use. Yeah. Finally, all of the CGI and live action elements are combined together digitally. This involves transferring all of the isolated elements onto computer and then matting each element onto the background. The result is a perfectly rendered CGI army brought to life in a mechanical toy land of epic proportions. At ILM, the spectacular has become the expected. But that doesn't stop Ken Ralston and his cohorts from continuing to look forward. And you're always trying to push that envelope, give the audience and the production people something that will, you know, be unique and trying to find that next unique image is a, a constant challenge and I think that keeps us, you know, those juices flowing and it's, uh, it's what drives us crazy and I think it's what inspires us the most.